it's a new thing for me and I want to learn more and more. So I just tried and uh, out of 10, I got uh, two emulations uh, successfully. So uh, uh, that's why I'm here and I want to learn more. Okay. May, may I just go back to other than Zia, um, because I know what his uh, approximate cannulation success is. Can you tell me what your department and cannulation success approximately is? I won't catch you on that or anything. Just an idea. So what do you think is your departmental cannulation success? 16, 17. Okay, what about you? No, no, no. Pre-cut to bagar pre-cut, na? 80 percent. Okay, sir. Uh, who was the other one? Uh, Zia ka to we know. Uh, I think at 70 percent. 70 percent. Yeah, but uh, but you know these are um, arbitrary figures. You know they're not for sure what what the actual. Yeah. So so when you log them, you would know exactly uh, what. Um, so before I ask the next question, you can go on the okay, non-hands-on. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Atif Majid. Uh, I am here from Karachi only. I am currently working as an assistant professor in gastroenterology at uh, Niljit Dao University. Um, we've got around uh, 40 to 50 ERCPs going on for a week, uh, in a week. Uh, and then uh, I've uh, been doing only supervised ERCPs. I believe my cannulation rate would be the lowest, around 20 to 25 percent. And uh, so far I've done, done around uh, 8 to 10 ERCPs under supervision. I'm Dr. Zishan Ali. I'm from Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Department of Medicine. And uh, we are not offering uh, ERCP services at JPMC. Right now I'm here to learn the basics of the ERCP so that we can establish <coughs> ERCP services there. Okay. I'm Dr. Harris, uh, working as an associate professor in, in civil hospital. Uh, uh, last year I have attended a course of colonoscopy with you. And I decided that uh, to start with, you need the basic. So it is, I'm going to start my ERCP uh, observation status. And then because we have a facility in OT complex and I'm using the procedures, supervising my professor there. So if you have a correct knowledge, if you know the, how to proceed, so it is better to start with all good uh, backup. So that's why I'm here. Thank good. you. Good. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Salim Bakai from Jawadin Hospital, uh, working as assistant professor with uh, Dr. Zahmat Bas. Uh, with me, I have done about 13 uh, ERCPs under supervision of Dr. Zehna Abbas with two successful cannulations. And currently we are doing about uh, 8,200 ERCPs a year with a, with a possible successful cannulation of about 70 to 80% without pre-cut. Okay, great. Uh, one thing that we always emphasize is that uh, the observers are actually observers. We can't give any hands-on to observers. This is basically, but trust me, uh, as an observer for myself, uh, and I can, I'm sure I speak for Vakar as well, it's really enjoyable for us. Uh, and every time there has been a course, uh, forget about the trainees, at least I learn a lot. I have some very, very good colleagues coming and doing things which I, uh, every time I pick up a, a thing or two, and which is, which is how you keep on working because it's very important no matter what stage of life you reach and how good you are the day you stop learning i think is the day you should retire okay so techniques eh, the new things we all do things differently the other good thing about our course is you have three different um, uh, consultants from uh, fortunately all pakistani alhamdulillah um, from the UK's perspective, showing you the UK's methods and practices, sharing with you the US practices, and of course the way we do uh, in our setup here. Uh, between, in, in civil hospital, I, almost all of you know that we, we do approximately a thousand ERCPs a year, and just in this unit. Um, and uh, we are now, um, we have been doing um, a lot of other advanced procedures um, related
related to ERCP, we were doing spyglass. We were the first one, uh, which was the uh, regular, uh, the standard uh, spyglass. Now we've just acquired the digital spyglass as well. So we're the only center in the country that's doing that, and a few centers in the region that have spyglass. Uh, we will try if if time permits, we'll try you. Uh, we'll, we'll try and show that to you because that's something that's unique. Not many centers would have that in the world, and um, it's very useful. Not for every center, I believe, not because we have it, but I think it's a, it's very expensive. One probe is three and a half thousand dollars. Okay, so you don't do it properly or you mess it up. That's a three and a half lakh rupees gone for one case. Just the. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Um, <coughs> okay, I see uh, Professor Saeed Qureshi is here. Assalamu alaikum. Professor Saeed Qureshi is here, and so may I request you to come and say a few words, Saeed, please? As you just say hello, yeah. It's nice to know who the Vice Chancellor is. Well, I'm not here in my capacity as the Vice Chancellor. I'm just in my capacity as the host unit. Well, anyway, uh, this is an annual feature in this unit, the ERCP hands-on course, and it has now been running successfully uh, for a number of years. Dr. Vakar is here, and Dr. Vakar has been uh, a tutor on this since its inception. And uh, we are always grateful to him for his traveling, especially from the United Kingdom, to do this and also the colonoscopy workshop. Professor Tariq Mahmood is not here, but his uh, deputy is here to tell you something about radiology or the biliary tract. And then, of course, all of you, the participants, uh, are here. I think Dr. Saad now has plans uh, using my services as the Vice Chancellor to uh, convert or to start a new advanced endoscopy uh, um, uh, course uh, or a fellowship, I should say. So we are working on it and hopefully uh, that will be our next venture. So have a good three days and enjoy yourself and do and learn whatever you all can. And then, as I always say, then go on and teach uh, other colleagues what you have learned. Don't keep this knowledge to yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saeed. And I may add that, you know, we've been working here for about 11 years now. This is our 11th year. And, uh, well, in fact, October would be 12 years, so this is 11 and a half years almost. Um, and over the last 11, uh, 11 years, uh, it, it's the gentleman just who just spoke to you is, uh, is the man who had the vision of actually starting this and, 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 and providing us with the, with, the, with the facility where today we are sitting and, and hopefully um, going to enjoy over the next three days with whatever um, cases that we get. Um, I'm very privileged, and you're, we are all very privileged. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, um, our own countrymen uh, doing very well elsewhere in the world. Um, there's, this is an additional thing this time. Um, Dr. Mustafa Arai, he is an associate professor of medicine. He's director of Advanced Endoscopy Fellowship Gastroenterology Fellowship in uh, University of California, San Francisco. And um, this was a bonus we have for this course. I welcome you, Dr. Mustafa Rai. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out and coming over here. Uh, Dr. Khalid Hassan has actually introduced me to, uh, Khalid had introduced me to Mustafa. He was visiting here and uh, we were very happy to, to have him. So you will have uh, one more expert to, we, we will have one more expert to, to tell us what, how things are done um, far, far away from here. Uh, you already know about uh, our faculty, Sajda has already uh, told you, uh, one of a couple of things I want to mention. Um, 
all the faculty works here on an uh, on a uh, you know no payment basis so nobody has been nobody receives anything um, uh, they have come here we have Pakistan Society of Gastroenterology meeting starting uh, on Wednesday so we'll finish this and straight away um, they're actually literally flying straight from here to Lahore um, so it's done on um, you know ju just just with the spirit to teach uh, there's nothing that the faculty get out of none, none of the faculty members uh, get anything out of this. So with that, um, just a little introduction, um, because Doc Saab is here first time, just mentioned we have a small unit, um, uh, but we try and do whatever uh, is possible. We do ERCPs, we're doing about a thousand ERCPs a year in this unit. Um, and um, with related to ERCP, we are doing spyglass and we do the whole works. Uh, we do pediatrics here as well and we have a large number of pediatric cases um, with chronic pancreatitis and stones in the, mostly, mostly stones and, and calcific pancreatitis. Uh, we also do EUS uh, and we do the whole works. EUS uh, as far as biliary drainage and, 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 and then the rest of the therapeutic techniques that are available with it. And um, the rest of the endoscopy procedures, of course, uh, are all done here. The entire unit is actually provides the, everything is provided free of cost here. So not a patient does not pay for a cannula or for an injection or for anything. Whether it's metallic stent, non-metallic stent, or whatever, EUS, FNA, BD, whatever we do, capsule, um, and uh, spyglass, we have the spyglass digital. Um, so everything is provided uh, for free. We have EHL, we don't have laser. Um, and so this entire setup is actually free of cost. Uh, and uh, um, I think one of the things I can very proudly say is that in terms, in terms of advancement uh, and maybe in terms of numbers as well, we're probably the, m the number one center in the country. Uh, we do yearly courses in ERCP, colonoscopy, um, and now this is the first year when we'll be doing an EUS course. That'll be done in April. So um, with that introduction, um, thank you very much, Sajda, and over to you, and you can tell us what we are gonna do. Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. Now I would like to request Dr. Shazia to please come and give a brief uh, introduction of role of radiology in ERCP, Dr. Shazia. Start working. Uh, see if can. Thank you so much, Dr. Saida. Uh, it's really a great honor for me uh, to speak in front of all my seniors, especially Dr. Saeed Qureshi, even Dr. Saida, because this is my parent institute and uh, I did my graduation, then I did my house job, so after 18 years, it's quite a long time. And uh, it's really a blessing for us that uh, it, uh, the more advancement and the techniques you people are using and the best of the thing that you are delivering to your juniors and obviously for the patients. It's really a, a blessing for everyone. So uh, my talk is about radiology and radiation safety during the ERCP procedure. Coming to the topic is basically basic radiology and safety during ERCP. The outline of my presentation is modalities. You people have an idea, but uh, just a review so that you can see what are the modalities uh, one can use to utilize the biliary tract. Then the properties of the x-rays and uh, fluoroscopy and radiography, dose reduction in patient and staff, and justification, again, is a very important thing uh, when are you are deciding for any investigation, and the practical tips, how to reduce the radiation dose. Modalities uh, which are available for duct evaluation, baseline is ultrasound imaging or the color Doppler, in which you can see the biliary tract, and you can see the CBD and uh, obviously the gallbladder. Then you can have an option of CT scan, 
in which you can uh, you can see the track even you can have a MRI option that are the heavily T2 weighted images, obviously in the, to see the roadmap, to plan something. And then you have TTC or T tube cholangiograms that you can do and obviously ERCP, you people have an idea about it. Now coming to physics, the basic properties of X-rays. These are the photons and that is a packet of energy released by atom. And the important thing is that they travel in straight lines. And once they travel in straight line, they absorbed they transmitted or scattered through the body. And whenever in the fluoroscopy they produce image on the phosphor plate, however, in cases of the radiograph, uh, uh, silver bromide is used. And in cases of human body, when it ionizes atom in the living cells, then it can cause uh, cancer. So the interaction of rays with the matter, what happens? It is transmitted. Again, it can be absorbed, then you can see the image and it can be scattered in any direction. So attenuation is basically absorption plus scatter, and that forms the image. And this attenuation increases as the density of material is increases, or the atomic number of material is increases. And photon energy of X-ray, it decreases. The transmitted X-rays that read the image on the fluoroscopy or radiograph, and that provides a useful image. However, the scatter, that is the radiation which are scattered, that causes the reduced image quality as well as the unnecessary irradiation, not only to the patient, but to the person who is performing the procedure or the staff. So exposure, what is exposure? That is the measure of amount of radiation at a point, okay? So that is exposure. These are the sum terms. Energy absorbed by a matter at a point, that is dose, again, that's how the person is receiving the dose. And this is irradiation, that is transmission, absorption, or scatter. Fluoroscopy system components, just a review so that you people can have an idea. That is a how the fluoroscope is used. The X-ray tube, it could be under couch or over couch tube. It's according to the need. Obviously, you people, I think, use more under couch uh, technique. And then in that, there's a collimator. X-ray tube is here and the collimator and the filters, and on the top, if you can see the image intensifier, then you can see, yes, image intensifier, and there's an anti-scatter grid. These grid and the collimations help in reduction of the dose. Now, if you are uh, using the fluoroscope with the over couch position, radiations are released, you can see here, then they are scattered in these directions, and this is the area which is all irradiated. Obviously, when the distance is increasing, it decreases the radiation. Similarly, in the over couch uh, position of the uh, tube, again, the, you can see the, how the radiations are released as the, uh, you can see the X-ray tube is at the top, okay? And the image intensifier is at the uh, base. So, radiations are scattered and the area you can see here. So, this is all radiation exposure. Now, if you are using an under couch tube, if you can see here, you can appreciate here, and the image intensifies at the top, then again the radiations, and these are scattered in different directions, and this is all the area of high radiation, which is close to the tube. So, the radiations can be reduced by the distance, and the inverse coil law is the main law, that is the dose reduces by factor of four if you double your distance from the source. So distance again plays a very important role in case of, of the radiations. A scatter reduction, then you can use collimation that I've shown you uh, the mach uh, machine of the, uh, the base at the collimator are used and which can uh, reduce the radiation that is less coning, more tissue irradi irradiated, more scatter. If there's a coning means that you can have to target the area. If you can see here, it is more cone and it is large area of radiation. So large of radiation, more scatter, because there is this. And if you have just focused that area, there will be less radiations. So they, that is basically due to the collimation or coning. Then the grid is there. You can use the grid, and that is again, it is made of uh, lead, sorry. It is made of lead and with interspace material, and again, it is used to scatter the reduction uh, scatter re uh, reduces the scatter. 
basically radiation protection principle is based on the th three things that is justification again is that test is required or not optimization that is the best test that the optimum image with the lowest dose as low as reasonably possible that is alara principle is the baseline and the protection of staff that is not only the person who is performing the procedure but also the staff who is standing there or the helper is there radiation effects could be stochastic or deterministic these are not common in one or two procedures but if someone is uh, exposed to a long time so the stochastic effects could be probability proportional to the dose how are the deterministic effects severity is a function of the dose okay so in that cases this skin damage can occur sometimes even uh, sometimes cataracts but obviously not in your procedures but it depends on the how you are exposing and for the stochastic effects you don't it's proportional to the dose so radiogenic cancer and the genetic damage can occur now the spray radiation source there are two ways sometimes what happens when you are using a tube there's a leakage in the tube when you are do doing the procedure and just because of that leakage of the tube you can see here there's a scatter and the second scatter is from the patient when you give the primary beam and then it passes through the patient and then there's a scatter so these are the two ways of the scattering not only from the tube that uh, also from the patient when you are using the waves now you can see the scatter distribution if you see here the scatter intensity is higher on the entrance side of the dose that means if you are using from this side it is higher on this side and lesser on the exit side so the primary be uh, beam is more intense on the entrance side and the forward scatter is heavily attenuated spray radiation profile if you see here you can see here the more the distance there is more there is less radiation that is 0.25 mW per hour if you are standing on a long distance but if you are close to the patient there is a more area of radiation when you are close to the patient similarly if you are standing close to the tube so this is the more high radiation and the way the distance is increasing the rays are reduced and there are less radiation how to reduce occupational exposure when you are using the obviously the procedures and you are doing it uh, use short taps of fluoro instead of continuous exposure don't use a for a prolonged time utilizes last image hold for image study discussion and teaching instead of using the fluoroscopy and ones is teaching then that means you are continuously exposing or uh, develop workflow procedure with the ancillary personnel so that there is no fluoroscopic exposure when they need to close to the patient increase distance from the patient that is position yourself on the x-ray beam exit side obviously when you are using a shoot through or on the side then you should uh, uh, stand on the <coughs> exit side or the image intensifier side not on the x uh, along the x-ray tube side because scatter intensity is lower on the image intensifier side as compared to the x-ray tube side if you can see here this is the x-ray tube side so if you are standing close to it there are more radiation but if you are standing on the image intensifier side on the opposite side then there are less radiations then the image intensifier positioning the more close the image intensifier is there will be the less scatter dose saving features are uh, built in uh, in cm and the fluoroscopy they have an options then you can use the pulse fluoroscopy last image hold that i've told you and the fluoroscopic image storage avoids high doses radiographs that you needed avoidance of unnecessary exposure can be uh, prevented by using protective clothing dosimeters so that you can have a check that uh, how much you are exposed uh, check tubes over or under the table that means is there any leakage from the tube or not that you once you are uh, doing the procedure there should be check of um, uh, tube is there lead protection for the operator and nurse is available on uh, there or not and does everyone in the room really need to be there or not is again very very important uh protective clothing if you can see here there the apron should be well tailored and there is if there is a need of thyroid collar it depends then the eye protection it depends if you are using that procedures or the gloves if you have a very uh, much use of the hands of direct exposure in that cases you have to use these things 
personal healing devices, the proper fit is critical. Two layers are needed. Again, it's very important to meet 0.5 mm lead equivalent requirement. Make sure that the overlap is sufficient so that there is less radiation exposure. Arm holes should not be too wide. Neckline should not be fall too low. So these are the things which you one should take care of. The lead apron should be equivalency 0.25 mm to 0.5. Obviously 0.35 absorbs more scatter, but the thing is that they are very heavy. So it's really difficult to carry them. Uh, lead aprons should be properly stored on a hanger after using them instead of just uh, to throw it on the floor or somewhere on the chair because uh, they can damage, they can get cracked. Aprons should be checked annually for holes, cracks or other forms of deterioration. Again, it's very, very important. Thyroid shield, it depends on the need. If uh, its use is recommended, if monthly collar badge reading exceeds four millisievert, then one should use. Similarly, the lead glasses, if the uh, monthly collar badge reading exceeds four millisievert, in that cases, one should wear. And the leaded glass, 0.5 mm lead equivalent shielding recommended if hands must be in the primary beam. Then one should take care of and must wear gloves in that cases. Time, again, it plays a very important role as radiation is only produced when the beam is on. So irradiate only when it is necessary to observe the motion, okay? And don't irradi irradiate mo uh, more if uh, last image hold and instant replay can usually save the dose. So you can save it. Distance again, I've told you that is the radiation doses personal can be significantly reduced by increasing the distance from the radiation source. So it plays again important role. Now the tips to reduce exposure. First ask radiographer to initially uh, center with light. That means collimation. Again, it's very, very important to reduce the dose. Coning in around the region of interest. That means you should be only expose the region of interest. And in that cases, there will be reduced scatter, reduced dose to all, and it also improves the image quality as well. Always check that assistant is ready before asking to screen. And stop screening whenever a maneuver is completed and explain to the radiographer need for the prolonged screening if required. It depends on you. Use pulse fluoro. Uh, patient comfort is again very important and awareness of the colleague's limbs. If uh, somebody is holding a patient for the movement, in that cases, you should be very careful using the fluoroscopy. For personal monitoring, uh, for your benefit, reading should correl correlate with your workload. Obviously, if you are using mo uh, more, then you have to be take care of it. Overlead monitor on the midline at neck level, underlead monitors on midline at waist level, they can be used to check your personal dosage. Again, where do you, where one should stand using a C-arm? I've told you before that when using a lateral and the oblique projection, the scatter radiation, the primary beam are least intense on the exit beam side. So try to stand over to the exit beam side instead of the entry side because there will be more radiations on that side. Radiation safety management programs are again very important. That is a safe environment for patient and staff is important, appropriate level of image quality, again, is important. Minimize the waste radiation, radiation information for continuing patient benefit assessment, and ELARA that is as low as reasonably possible for staff is, again, very, very important. Uh, conclusion is that x-rays should be used judiciously and wear maximum protective clothing, take care of yourself, uh, use those reducing facilities, and communicate well with the assistant and radiographer. But before, after that, I just like to have a review so that you can have an imaging idea that obviously we discussed that the ultrasound Doppler in which you can see the image and you can see the calculi in the CBD with dilated CBD and MRI for the ro uh, role mapping of the imaging and you can see the pathologies. Then you can have an option of PET scan, but uh, it's a facility, I'm just sharing it because of Tarek really wanted to share because obviously it's a facility at JPMC which is totally free of cost, okay? And uh, obviously in uh, biliary tract imaging it's not very diagnostic, but for the staging purpose, if one needs, then obviously it plays an important role. So one can do for staging the tumors and we have an option of cyberknife robotic radio surgery. It's a very advanced type of radiotherapy. It's a targeted radiotherapy and the advantage of this is that you can target the tumor 
uh, in cases in which more than 1,000 sites. So we are doing it for the liver, not for the gravy tract. But it's just a, we have done cases of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in METS, and there are good results. But unfortunately, in some cases, we have noticed that there are lesion in the new areas because the liver is compromised in that. So selection cri criteria is, again, is very important when we use cyber knife robotic radiosurgery. It's a basically a targeted radiotherapy, OK? So primary uh, or metastatic tumor up to three, cent three in number with cumulative size of seven centimeter. And child score AD having seven, 700 cc or more normal liver volume is again needed. Because if the spared liver is not uh, uh, more than 700, then you cannot manage it. And the alternative, it is the alternative to TACE or RFA when these are contra indicated of fail, especially in sometimes what happens uh, during uh, taste, you don't find the vessel. And the, obviously, the interventional radiologist is confused. Sometimes you don't get the vessel to embolize and uh, to manage. So in that cases, one can use the radiosurgery for that. It is, again, also uh, free of cost at uh, JPMC. And it's the only machine in Pakistan right now, and which is uh, totally free. Uh, the treatment is totally free over there. Before starting the, obviously, that uh, targeting uh, area, traditional as uh, these are the goal markers, they are placed because the thing is that it's a robotic radiotherapy. So what happens when the uh, patient inspires or expires, these organs move. So to target that area, you need uh, some metallic objects so that the robot can uh, identify that object and then target. So that's why in that cases, we use uh, traditionals. But obviously, for the tumors of the brain and other places, we don't need fiducials in all cases. Uh, especially in the abdominal organs, we have to, because there's a movement. And in, even in chest. This is one of the cases I would like to share that uh, pre-cyber, this was the hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can see the planning images. Obviously, we uh, draw the tumor. And obviously, we have to decide whether this is the fall off of the dose and everything. And uh, this was the reduction in size of tumor. Of tumor. These were my references. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shazia. If there are any questions? It's an excellent presentation. Um, I just want to know, after finishing a procedure in the room, hmm. uh, for how long does the radiation last? Uh, uh, does it uh, it doesn't, doesn't uh, last does it long. Last no, no. Once you are exposing your fluoroscope or hmm. CR, then it is. That's why I've told you it's only when it's on. Otherwise, once you close, all radiation goes away. It doesn't stay there. OK. And for this dosimeter, uh, uh, for after how much time we have to re uh, check that whether we have exposed? It depends. Exposed. Three monthly sometimes. Okay. And, and what, what we should do then if we are uh, enough exposed to the radiation? Yeah, if you are uh, exposed to radiation and your dose is uh, you know, at a higher limit or above the higher limit, in that cases, one should uh, rotate and uh, one should uh, avoid that procedure for some time. And you can manage what you do to uh, expose like that means you are using the fluoroscope more. Or so for how much time? That's the time period for which the patient should stay away from the fluoroscopy exposure. The patient is obviously exposed the to one person, time. The obviously, person. the person if yeah. you are using for some time, not for necessarily. Time. But you should just avoid that instead of that. Because once your dose is exposed, you should avoid, start avoiding it to reduce it. Thank you. That's it. For the observer, distance is uh, usually the more uh, the more far away from the tube, the lesser the uh, radiation. So it's not a specific that you can say that uh, five centimeter, ten centimeter, or uh, that way. Obviously, if the observer is standing, he has to stand close. But as I've told you, to the exit side of the beam, that means if the image intensifier and the tube is there, so instead of standing close to the tube, you should uh, try to st uh, stand uh, on the exit side of the tube. So uh, that will be reduced dose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shazia. Uh, can I request Dr. Saad to please uh, present a token of appreciation to Dr. Shazia?
basic model here, okay? So please don't compare it with uh, what happens in the human body. Human body is much easier, okay? This is the, the best we could have got. The second option is to do simulation wala. Personally, I've really not been impressed by the simulation um, system. Um, and uh, so what happens is this is not about cannulation. This is not about success. Actually, this entire course is not about success. Please don't be very happy. Look, I did cannulation by myself. Makes no difference to me. You can have cannulation in one out of five cases means nothing. You, have you done everything as it should be done is what you need to know. As we, all of you, some of you, well, in fact, most of you have done colonoscopy courses. It's, uh, it's about reaching the, uh, the cecum or the terminal ileum in a correct way. The same thing applies here. ERCP can be harmful, okay? You can kill patients with this. And that's something that you should never forget, okay? If you are not comfortable, first of all, it has to be done for the right indication. We know you're all post fellows and martial assistant professors, so we didn't bore you with reason, I mean, but um, we, this is something that we must discuss over the next few days, we will certainly. The indication has to be correct. If it's not correct, you have no grounds to defend yourself. Up there, here there is no accountability where docs up, both of them come, they will have a tough time. So if you know that what you're gonna do might harm your patient, then you will take all the necessary precautions that you would for anybody that you love or care for, and that's important. So, um, once you know that you're doing it for correct reason, then the next step is that you do it correctly. From intubation to cannulation and whatever else you is needed. If you're not comfortable with something, stop. You're going to harm your patient by doing something that you're not comfortable with. The chances are far more than stopping. Call somebody. I'm sure there'll be somebody in all, all of your units. You have someone senior. Leave the procedure, call them. Uh, this happens regularly in my unit. Uh, you know, uh, if I'm not immediately in the room, they'll hold, I'll come back, we'll do whatever needs to be done, and that's it. And the advantage of that is that you will learn the right way of handling that problem without harming your patient. So I can't emphasize more this particular point. I have, we all have complications. There is no one who doesn't. And if somebody says they don't have complications, they're either not doing it or lying. Point is, was it because of my mistake or was it a routine complication? I'm doing cannulation, go straight, I have messed up with the ampulla and patient ends up having pancreatitis. I'm sorry, I couldn't have done anything. It will happen. But in our own unit, with prospective studies, we have a complication. Pancreatitis is less than 3%. I think it's 2.9%. Um, all comers. This is training, non-training. We, we did a prospective. Uh, in fact, we published it as well. So, and then we do some of the most difficult cases that are done here. The problem with, with pancreatitis is, again, is a wrong selection quite often. Okay. The difficult cases generally don't. Pancreatic diseases, you don't get pancreatitis that often. It's when you do those young patients, females, who you're not sure of, soft indication, that's when you end up having problems. So um, complication is part of any therapeutic procedure. There are percentages given, and we must all know, and we should aim to be within, or less than that, can be better. Uh, and so this whole course is about this. If we can teach you to stop, we have achieved a big goal. 
and we'll keep emphasizing that. We have done 25 cases, uh, 25 into 525 cases in the last five courses, and we have had zero failure in cannulation. Now these are easy cases, so you can, somebody might stand up and say, well, we've done stones and regular fixtures, so what's the big deal? What I'm trying to emphasize is that you can have a 100% cannulation success when you've got ampulla almost in simple cases. We've done a few needle knives, but it should not be more than five or seven, I think. That's, that's probably le definitely less than 10. So it tells you that our cannulation success just without needle knife is over 90%, and that's what is expected. And that's what we have published, um, and needle knife where we have published. And that's what we emphasize that, uh, you know, your cannulation success should be around 90%, um, ideally, before you start thinking about needle knife. So um, I think that's what you need to aim for. Because it's very easy at 60%, you're saying six out of 10 and you just keep cutting. You're cutting, okay? So with that, what we're gonna do is, uh, are we ready? Okay, well that gives me a few minutes. Lots of, uh, um, again, welcome. Um, you can come and sit here in the front if you want to. Uh, you're here with us uh, for the whole day, Ji, inshallah. So, everybody, please. No, no, no problem, Ji. Please, uh, Dr. Vakar uh, is our part of our unit, uh, like Khalid. Uh, this unit, as, as we all are. So, um, okay, you should, um, just while we're waiting for this, it's, okay, we, we, it's very important to, to tell your patients what you're going to do like in any procedure, and what are the risks? Don't quote risks of doctor, I mean the complication uh, percentages of Dr. Uh, Mustafa Rai or Dr. Vakar Ahmed or Khalid. That doesn't apply to you. Or what is published in the literature from, uh, from Florida or from Harvard or from wherever, you know, San Francisco or from Manchester. You need to quote your own. And then see whether the patient agrees or not, okay? And you can tell them, this is what I have not done. I'll tell you honestly, patient will respect you for the rest of your life. And the doctor is very honest. Okay? So, please tell them about pancreatitis, bleeding. If you don't, and this happens, Pakistan is no more the society that it used to be. You might get away with doing this in civil hospital or maybe in some of the other hospitals, but you will not be able to get away with this if you did somebody who's known to me. I will make sure that things go wrong. Even if it's my colleague, I don't care. If he hasn't mentioned, then he's in trouble. So please tell them, bhai ye, ye, ye ho sakta hai, rather than them having afterwards and then coming to another center. So it's important when you're taking consent to tell them. Um, and I, I, you know, it's important also in my opinion, tell them this is my success. If you want to go to Wakar, please go. You can find him. You know, usually just hospital may happen when you over. So, so, and and obviously work hard on getting there with cannulations and with complications. So that's that's the thing. Ready? Now this is a nightmare for us too, so it's not easy.
not talking about going down. It's a good thing to do the ERTP without looking when you are actually down in the deep in it. Vakar, I know Vakar can do it. With his eyes closed. I was just saying, I was just asking information. And somebody has said, you should have asked him, which is I said, like this. And that's been very sad. Anyway, so intubation, you can either do visually, even with the side wear, or you can go blind as well. Interestingly, side wear is 